Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us today from near and far for our webinar on the insights into the EU OACPS negotiations 2018 to 2021 and what are the implications for the future partnership. My name is Caroline Löbrich, and I am Program Manager for Democracy and Sustainable Development at the Multinational Development Policy Dialogue of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Brussels. And just last week, on the 15th of April, the post Cotonou agreement was initialed, meaning that the negotiation process is now officially over. The partnership agreement will be concluded for the next 20 years, and it will be the new legal framework for the relationship between the European Union on the one side and its partners from 79 African, Caribbean and Pacific countries on the other. So next, the agreement will undergo national and regional procedures for approval so that it can enter into force after ratification, hopefully later this year. And in terms of content, the new agreement will be based on common strategic priority areas, among which are democracy and human rights, economic and human development, peace and security, but also migration and mobility and climate change. What is new is that the agreement will have a three-in-one structure with three regional protocols to better address the specific needs and dynamics of the different geographic regions, each with their own specific governance structures. But the question today is, what do the long and intense negotiations tell us about the future relationship between the EU and the OACPS partners? And what lessons can we draw from it? On the basis of our new report that was just published this morning, we will have a closer look at some occurring developments and challenges in the negotiation process. The roles and different actors, such as the OACPS Secretariat and the African Union. And we will also discuss if the new agreement can address geopolitical realities of our modern times. So I'm very excited to be joined today by our expert, first and foremost, of course, Len Ismail, who is former ambassador of the Eastern Caribbean states to Belgium and the European Union, and who is also, and more importantly, the author of our report. A very warm welcome to you, Len. After Len has presented her findings, we will then have input statements from the negotiation parties, namely from Domenico Rosa, who is Head of Strategic Partnerships with Africa and the ACP at the European Commission, and Morgan Gitinji, who is Head of the OACPS Secretariat Task Force on Negotiation. Thank you both very much for joining us today. We will then um, have time for an open discussion uh, with questions from you, from the audience, um, and that uh, will be moderated by Gert Laporte, who is Deputy Director at ECDPM. Nice to see you again, Gert. Finally, my colleague will wrap up the discussion. Welcome also to Gunther Rieckmann Kayo, Policy Advisor for Economy and Trade in Sub-Saharan Africa at our CAS headquarter in Berlin. Once again, I would really like to thank everyone joining us today. I am very excited for the debate and to find out more about Len's finding. With that, I pass over to you, Fred. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. I think we can uh, move right away into the presentation by Lane. Uh, Lane, you have uh, some 15, 16 minutes, please. Thank you so very much, Gert, Caroline. It's such a pleasure to be here uh, to present this uh, rather short report to you. But before getting right to the body of the report, allow me to express my appreciation to CAS, led by Dennis Schrey, for sticking with the negotiations, which ultimately stretched over many, many more years than we could have expected. Keeping substantive threads alive over so much time was challenging especially when more important actors in the process changed and a pandemic, of course, emerged. Secondly, of course, I'm deeply appreciative to colleagues on both sides for the generosity of their time. I value their trust and confidence. Ultimately, however, the views expressed, omissions, misinterpretations, of course, are all mine. A few preliminary observations before getting into the meat of the report. The first is to emphasize that the objective of the report was not to speak to the merits or demerits of positions taken by either party, but to follow the process of the negotiations. Secondly, negotiations are about power and leverage. While power symmetries exist in the relationship between both the EU and the OACP, ultimately, however, we find 
that negotiations are not only about power, but tactics. Tactics were coercive. Pressure was exerted to conclude quickly, or delay was used to create possibilities for more desirable outcomes. Trust was, of course, breached from time to time. The process was challenging. The EU 27 on the one side, the ACP 79 on the other, involved large numbers of widely different stages of development, histories and geographies, making internal cohesion rather difficult. Sticky points were encountered and red lines were drawn. Both sides dug in. Bracketed text remained until the end. Closing the gap required political intervention. And finally, diluted text around which tenuous agreement could be derived when finally placed on the table. My aim is to present main findings bundled according to a few thematic areas, starting with the backdrop drop against which these negotiations took place. In the 20 years of the Cotonou Agreement, many things of course have changed. Most obvious is the fact that the world has changed, so has the EU, but so of course have ACP countries. New global actors have emerged in the geopolitical scene. And as the status quo evolves, developing countries like the ACP group have a much wider menu of choice. Membership of the EU has expanded. Countries from Eastern Europe, not party to Cotonou, negotiated the successor agreement. They do not share the colonial experiences of their member countries of the West. Their views on the EU ACP relationship are more pragmatic and perhaps a bit more transactional. Countries on the ACP side have also changed. Poverty remains an issue and SIDS continue to be characterized by unique vulnerabilities, but many countries are middle income. Some like South Africa are themselves global actors on the world stage. Africa will be home to the largest and youngest labor force. Europe on the other hand, though still prosperous is aging rapidly and accounts for a declining share of global wealth. Attitudes have changed. There's a shift from the donor recipient prescription of over 20 years ago. And we saw an assertiveness on the ACP side, which was not evident 20 years ago. While Cotonou was seen as a model for delivering on some development objectives, the level of political engagement did not materialize as was originally envisaged. This was seen by some EU member states as diminishing the value of the relationship with the OACP. They advocated a clear preference for direct EU relations with ACP regions and with the AU on Africa. Collateral damage, namely the viability of the ACP as an institution. And the mood has changed. Observers of the treaty negotiations 20 years ago, Geert, you being one of them, spoke of the excitement and enthusiasm which accompanied news of Cotonou. News that agreement had been reached in December 2020, however, is said to have been met with a distinct lack of enthusiasm here in Brussels. Let's take a quick look at the negotiation process. First, the process was long. Setting the groundwork on the EU side started as early as November 2016. The OACP was not quite as agile in getting off the blocks. Reactive rather than proactive in the early stages, but that changed with momentum swinging between the two sides. Formal negotiations began on the margins of the UN General Assembly uh, in November 2018, September 2018. Negotiating rounds proceed both in Brussels as well as in the regions. The EU set an early, very hard deadline to complete by July 2019 before the assumption of duties by new EU leadership in November. The OACP felt that positions between the parties were way too wide and it was not in their interest to be rushed into early conclusion. The deadline of July 2019 was pushed back. In any event, handing over to new EU leadership was delayed. Key appointments were also held up for some time with cascading delays affecting agreement on the new EU budget with consequential uncertainties regarding financing elements of the new agreement. The new EU leadership faced competing priorities, Brexit, populism, migration and security, the relationship with China, the relationship with the United States, all competed for attention. EU OACP negotiations were simply not on the front burner. And then of course there was COVID. Ultimately, transitional arrangements had to be implemented. These were extended to December 2020 and then twice more 
to March 2021 and finally November 2021. The negotiation atmosphere was generally cordial, but like most negotiations, was colored at times by misgivings, mistrust, some tactics felt coercive. The rush to seal the deal before the summer of 2019 fell into that category. So too did the second push by the commission to seal the deal before commencement of the German presidency of the EU Council in July 2020, with a suggestion that it would be in the OACP's interest to do so, given that the German presidency was expected to result in less flexibility and tougher negotiating positions. The ACP was of the view that wedge diplomacy was being applied to undermine cohesion of the group, but they too sought friends on the other side as opportunities arose to do so. Questions of trust came to the fore at the height of the negotiations with the EU's publication of a black list of high risk third countries on charges of money laundering and terrorism financing. The list included OACP members. On matters of governance, human rights and freedoms, the ACP group felt that the EU was holding them to higher standards and tougher conditions relative to some EU member states as evidence of double standards and power differentials in the relationship between the two. Internally, a number of issues set both the tone and the pace of the negotiations, key of which was the reality of multiple interests and lack of internal cohesion within both parties. EU countries, of course, have different geographies and histories, and the perception of risk and threats differ. The bloc is also differentiated economically, and the negotiations laid bare some historical and structural fissures in the EU running along two axes, north and south and east and west. EU support for middle income countries, former colonies, the OACP relationship and financing for the new treaty divided the bloc not neatly, but generally between east and west. Issues related to migration, security, the EU budget and some others also split the bloc along a north-south divide. And these divisions were well known to the other side and were used from time to time. Within the OACP, regional interests did not always neatly converge to the wider common position. And these are a little bit more articulated in the report. But ultimately, on both sides, there was a very keen sense that negotiations were taking place as much within the parties as externally, diluting their overall effectiveness. The successor treaty retains some characteristics of Cotonou, but also introduces several new elements, including those related to the principle of regionalization and changes to financial relations, both of which are important. Regionalization offers a greater role for the six regions, afforded a more direct relationship with the EU. It also brings with it other issues. It envisages engagements of OACP member countries, specifically in the Caribbean and the Pacific, with non-ACP countries in their geographic areas. With the Pacific, this is fairly straightforward. After all, the relationship with Australia has historically and continues to be close. Africa is increasingly expected to fall under the AU umbrella in the relationship with the EU. The Caribbean, however, is an entirely different story. Regionalization envisages greater collaboration with Latin America. And despite the geographic proximity of the two, the ties between the Caribbean and Latin America have been neither robust nor deep. Strong ties have been personality driven by Lula and Chavez, for example, by Raul and Fidel Castro, by Daniel Ortega, for example. But generally speaking, ties are not systemic and interests are not necessarily shared. Regionalization also presents to the OACP as a further demonstration by the EU to continue fragmentation of the institution and with it perhaps ACP solidarity, a process seen to have commenced with EPA negotiations more than 10 years ago. Additionally, fuel was provided by the communique issued by the AU on March 18th, 2018, of its intention to negotiate on behalf of Africa outside of the framework of the ACP. Of course, we know this failed to materialize given the lack of consensus within Africa about the role of the AU in the negotiations, 
and a lack of agreement regarding the delegation of competencies required to allow for the undertaking of grand political bargains on behalf of Africa. The EU view of Africa is a jewel in the OECP crown. The fact that Africa is the only one of three constituent parts of the OECP to have its own standalone budget. The clear call by some EU actors for engagement with Africa through the AU calls for creation of an AU, an EU commissioner for African affairs, a part of an ongoing narrative with implications for the role of the AU, and of course, the future of the OACP. Perhaps a wider point in all of this is the fact that the greater the role of the AU in representing the interest of Africa, the deeper the relations between the regions, the capitals and the EU, the greater the likelihood for an overall diminished role for the OACP. The institution and its members lost vital time over the last 20 years in focusing on making the relationship with Europe work, but not focusing equally and with the same intensity on the relationship between themselves. And today, a network of deeper relations would have served the organization in good stead in making the case for a vital role beyond that of the interlocutor with the EU. Now, of course, in all negotiations, there were sticky issues and red lines, and this was certainly the case in these negotiations. Agreement between the parties were easily reached and negotiations were fairly straightforward on a number of issues, including environmental issues, trade, and one or two others. However, it was clear from the previous relationship that a number of areas would continue to remain contentious. For example, the new treaty speaks to shared and common interests and values around human rights, sexual and reproductive rights, civil freedoms, and others. But these are subject to various degrees of interpretation. While there is, of course, a general agreement regarding the importance of these values, a divide remains in the means and pace of implementation and the importance of cultural traditions and norms as shaping their context. Some developing countries view values such as democracy and human rights as worthy and aspirational goals, but not on the first tier of priorities. They believe it important to grow the economy first and use economic dividends to secure values. There were, of course, a number of other sticky issues, beginning with gender identification and sexual orientation. These were sensitive, particularly for some African countries who felt again that these should be contextualized by cultural norms and of course, traditions. Issues related to rule of law and justice, the matter of the death penalty, deportation, post-sentence of for foreign criminals in the absence of proper frameworks for both discussion and reintegration, the jurisdiction of the ICC, migration, the matter of return and readmission, international taxation, all pose challenges to both sides. And some matters remain contentious until the very end and no doubt will continue to play a role in implementation. Funding the post Cotonou Agreement raised another bundle of sticky issues. Under the Cotonou Agreement, a standalone independent financial instrument, the EDF, provided both certainty and predictability to financial arrangements. Under the new agreement, aside from Africa with an identifiable, well-resourced financing envelope, Resources for the other initiatives, including those for the Pacific and the Caribbean, are subsumed under the newly streamlined Neighborhood Development and International Cooperation Financial Instrument, and these were not identified. Specific allocations for the Caribbean and Pacific regions, the OACP Secretariat intra-ACP resources do not form part of the agreement, or at least they did not when this report was concluded at the end of December. Nonetheless, after a break of several weeks, EU negotiators returned to the table in mid-November with significantly diluted text, paving the way for announcement that agreement on a successor to the CPA had been reached on December 3, 2020. Outstanding issues remain. The treaty, as we heard from Caroline, was initialed a few days ago, meaning that the text is now frozen. However, compromise and diluted text allowed the party to close the gap on some contentious issues and conclude negotiations. However, specifics remain vague. There is ample room for varying interpretations and the potential to create tensions during implementation, of course, remains. Up to the very end, the EU had yet to declare who would be party to the agreement on its side, whether the EU Commission or EU member states. 
Of course, the process of securing the agreement of the EU Council and Parliament will be challenging and, of course, long. And even though the text is frozen, there is still the sense that some EU member states might wish to revisit closed text. The case being made for an increasing role for the AU vis-a-vis -vis that of the OACP in Africa's relationship with Europe remains unfinished and is complex. The notion of a binary choice between the two is based on a false premise. A successor to the CPA has been negotiated with distinct roles for the OACP and the AU. The two are completely separate and distinct entities. In the meantime, Africa has not yet reached consensus on the overarching role of the AU. In the meantime, African member states will exercise membership in both institutions and continue to shape them until such time that the usefulness of either has run its course. A scaled down OACP will remain on the institutional landscape. At some point, its members too will decide whether or not the amended Georgetown Agreement provides a compelling basis for the development of a future beyond that of engagement in the relationship with Europe. Now, of course, hard questions will be asked. With each region now equipped with their own programs and financing arrangements, some may very well question the added value of the OACP framework, but that of course remains in the purview of the membership of the OACP to decide. Several questions remain regarding mechanisms for coordination between the old and additional new layers of institutions, procedures and non-ACP countries brought in by regionalization. Sticky issues remain well into the process and will remain well into the process of implementation and financing arrangements for some aspects of the treaty remain unclear. And finally, as we look to the future, ultimately, despite its shortcomings, the legacy of the Cotonou Partnership Agreement will surely be that of its stature and its ambition as a model for North-South Development Corporation. A new chapter in the relationship between Europe, Africa, the Caribbean and the Pacific group of countries has been written. And the future, of course, is full of knowns and unknowns. As the regions engage more directly with Europe within their own geographic spheres, what will the future of ACP solidarity look like? The core relationships between Africa, the Caribbean and the Pacific have remained underinvested for so long. Can these be turned around? The OACP for so long, the pivot around which the relationship with Europe centered will no longer play such a dominant role what will its final contours look like? And very finally, assuming all goes well, the new partnership agreement will be signed by the end of 2021 and will come into force once ratified. Following three years in the making, the EU, Africa, the Caribbean, the Pacific will embark on a journey on a new partnership agreement, which will guide the relationship for a further 20 years into the future. Only history and time will judge either the merits or the demerits of these new relations. Over to you, Gert. Thank you, Leiden. Thank you very much for a, a very complete and also a very honest picture. You were there during part of the negotiations. You took some distance, but you're looking at this with uh, the eyes of uh, both someone who wants to continue this type of cooperation, but who also is aware of all the complexities. And I think you described very well the changed context now in 2020, 2021, as compared to 2000, the lengthy negotiating process, the fact that it did not always mobilize a lot of uh, enthusiasm, uh, that it also uh, finally uh, resulted in a quite complex arrangement that tries to build compromises between different interest groups, between different types of objectives, including uh, the regionalization ambitions that the European Union has been uh, putting forward. You also pointed to a number of contentious issues. We can come back to these uh, later on and also to the funding issue. And last but not least, very important, because this is an issue that is not always raised, uh, the final decision-making on the European side. Uh, will this an EU-only type of agreement, or will it uh, still be a shared type of agreement? The jury is still out. There's still a lot of legal work uh, that uh, will need to be done to finally come forward with an agreement that will be signed by the EU institutions only or by the EU and its member states. With this, I would like to uh, invite uh, Domenico Rosa, who was also there 
from the very beginning and has been playing a very important role on the side of the European uh, Union, on the side of DEFCO, now INTPA, uh, to uh, use uh, your seven and a half minutes as a first uh, reaction to uh, the presentation of LEN. And of course, feel free to also add your own important uh, considerations with uh, this uh, new agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hert, uh, and thank you very much, Caroline, for the invitation to this, uh, this event. Uh, apparently, it was very timely because, as you remember, the test was initiated last week. I, I also thank Len for the, the comprehensive and exhaustive presentation she did about her report. And uh, sometimes it's a little bit fun to, to see how things are seen from outside, uh, and sometimes you have not the same perception where you, you are inside the, the negotiation. So, uh, but let's let's go into the bulk of the uh, of the discussion. I'm not so sure that uh, there were so many differences in the negotiation between the ACP and the and the EU. Of course, we we, we started from a very different point uh, because on one side we were forced in a way to develop negotiating directives that were very much detailed in the, the sense of the European Union. If you take our negotiating directive as the, the, they've been approved by the Council, they were a kind of, I would say, pre-treaty in a way uh, already with the structure, with, uh, I would say, a lot of details for, for each point. That was not the case for the, for the ACP. And, and therefore, I think that this at the very beginning required a, a necessary adjustment, an adjustment that I think Went, went pretty well. Uh, first of all, we had this uh, regional seminar uh, at political level with ministers in Africa, in, in Eswatini, in uh, Samoa for the Pacific, and in Jamaica for the, for the Caribbean, where we managed to, I would say, set a, a kind of uh, perimeter or area of, for discussion with the three regions. I must say that uh, considering the, the complexity of the negotiation, uh, we did this job in, in, in a record time, in a way, because uh, it's covering a very high number of topics, issue areas, and so on. And the fact that we managed to, to come to what we can call the landing zone that is common to both parties in a such short periods is the best uh, witness of the fact that the position were not uh, so far. Of course, then the attention is uh, uh, focalized on, on issues that uh, were the, the most difficult or where we need, I would say, a little bit a longer discussion. Uh, and of course, but this is a in any in any negotiation, if everybody was uh, if everything was solved from the beginning, then uh, negotiation would be useless in in a way or another. But I think that uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, work, and uh, I, I'm not so sure that uh, in this kind of negotiation there were so many tactical moves in, in a way. Of course, on one side there was the the, the pressure that this is. Uh, was uh, something that was coming from the, 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 the Cotonou agreement that was setting, was expiring. And uh, there was, the, the, I think, and the, the political interest of not having any legal void in the relation between the EU and, uh, uh, and the ACP. There were some, uh, uh, I would say, institutional, uh, organizational uh, uh, issue on the ACP side, and in particular in the Africa part of the, of the ACP, concerning who and uh, what could be the role of the African Union in the negotiation. And this is something that hopefully the, the African side managed to, to solve through a proper decision of the, the African Union uh, Assembly. The head of state of the African Union decided which role should be allowed to the ACP and to the African Union. So I think that this was a fully honored decision by the, the African continent and the African countries on, on how to proceed uh, for the future. The most important is, is of course, that uh, compared to 2000, we managed to move into, into a new era where uh, the, the common challenges and uh, interests can be put together and considering also what is the, 
the differentiation that intervene in the meantime from 2020 to now between and even inside the three regions. We managed, I think, to get this complexity in a single agreement without, in a way or another, exploding the, the, the ACP solidarity. I know that uh, there can be doubt about the effectiveness or the usefulness of the OACPS. I consider that in a world that is beginning more and more polarized, where the multilateralism is, uh, is getting uh, less and less importance, and so on, the OACPS can play a role. And I think that this is, was exactly the subject of the summit that the OACPS organized in Nairobi and where the, the, the attention should focus for the future, in the, in the sense that the role is, uh, is, is changing and uh, is, is moving towards a more political and uh, partnership role. I'm not so sure uh, that there was a specific asymmetry in the negotiation. Uh, I have not the recollection that we came to situation where we were in a way, say, or take it uh, or leave it uh, point, but we tried uh, in any case to explain from where we were coming and uh, where we would like to go and also what were the difficulties that because we as negotiators, we were representing uh, our constituencies and our constituencies very often were not, I would say, coherent and uh, uh, aligned along uh, along the same line. So in a way, the, the work was twofold because on one side, uh, you had to try to reconcile the, the position, for, in my case, uh, within the, the EU 28 and 27 afterwards member state and for the ACP side, <clears throat> make more coherent position for 79 or in the case of the regional protocol of the different countries of the protocol. I must say that uh, uh, I have uh, an experience of this, uh, this negotiation that is uh, much less confrontational of what uh, one could expect. Uh, of course, there were lengthy talks, uh, uh, there were issues there. Of course, we are still a little bit far away, but I think that uh, the idea of having an agreement is trying to get a convergence uh, uh, on the most important uh, element uh, uh, and issues. I think that the, also the, the idea, and that this is something that is, uh, you, can, you can find all across the text that is now, is now public, is on how we'd like to, to support what are the multilateral and in the international processes. We have the Agenda 2030 in, and the Paris Agreement as overarching framework. In the case of the Africa Protocol, you have uh, the, all the policy framework that have been adopted by the African Union that uh, represent the, the, the backbone of this protocol, for instance, and uh, as well for the, the, the Caribbean and the Pacific, you have, I would say, the relevant regional or international framework that are uh, in a way mentioned and taken into account uh, for, the, for the future. So I think that uh, all in all, we managed to, to get a result that uh, in, in my view was, was not expectable in a such short time. And I don't think that everybody was uh, as uh, positive and optimist when the negotiation started uh, moreover with some uh, uh, delay in uh, New York in, uh, in September 2018. I would stop here because it's difficult to go to the different point that Len rightly mentioned, but uh, I think that most probably during the debate, uh, we could enter into, into some details of the, of the negotiation. Over to you, Gert. Thank you very much, uh, Domenico. Um, and this is indeed already an invitation to all uh, the people in the audience to put questions. Don't hesitate to use the question and answers or the chat uh, list with your questions. Uh, yes, Domenico, you had uh, quite a different perception than the perception that was put forward by Lane. Uh, you did not feel that there were many differences between the negotiating parties, um, less confrontational. Maybe the, the differences could have been within the groups themselves, eh? within the European Union, within the ACP, eh, where there was at least at a certain moment also some differences between African Union and OACPS. We can come back to that uh, in a minute. 
But let's first uh, listen to Morgan Gitinji, who has been in so many negotiations uh, of the ACP and uh, who has also seen probably the difference uh, with this negotiation as compared to previous negotiations. Are we moving towards uh, a new beginning of the OACPS, uh, Morgan? Uh, are we moving towards this widely heralded partnership of equals? Or did you feel that we still had a lot of asymmetries in the negotiating process? Please, over to you. Thank God, Conrad. Adenwa Stifton, CAS Foundation, for inviting the Secretary General of the OCPS, His Excellency Georges Rebelo Pinto Chicotti, to participate in this. He sends his best wishes and regrets he was not able to join us, wishing us a productive webinar. Let me also congratulate CAS for organizing it. It is taking place, as has been mentioned, at an opportune moment because as has been stated, the negotiations have concluded with the initialing on 15th of April by the chief negotiators. I think it is therefore a good time to address the topic of today, which is what are the implications for the future of the partnership? I would like to congratulate uh, the author of the report, Ambassador Dr. Lenny Schmeier. She has provided an insight or what one could call an insider's view of the process, one would think that she was in the front line of the negotiations in terms of the depth of her knowledge of what transpired in the negotiations. I really congratulate her for a very good report. I would say that some of the issues raised in the report could have served as distractions to the negotiators, but I'm happy to note that uh, the OECPS negotiators kept their eyes on the ball and managed to see the process to the end. I would say that uh, the OECPS negotiators really delivered on the mandate that was given to them by the OECPS Council of Ministers. It was a member-driven process with the negotiators from, drawn from the OECPS group of ambassadors in Brussels. The Secretariat provided technical and logistical support for the negotiations. Unfortunately, the work of the Secretariat was made easy by the selected team of ambassadors who are highly technically competent and therefore equal to the, uh, we really need to commend them highly for delivering on this uh, agreement. The mandate was that the OECPS would negotiate as a unified entity in a single undertaking. And the report brings out some of the challenges that uh, the OECPS side faced. There was an issue of the regional protocol, not initially in the OECPS. However, following the regional uh, meetings, which uh, Domenico has referred to, and an explanation of the need to bring closer to the regions the cooperation with the EU, the Council of Ministers upgraded the mandate to include the regional protocols, but still maintained that it should be a single agreement embodying the foundation and the three regional protocols, and all of them would be legally binding. Now, in terms of content, the mandate was informed and I think this helped to uh, converge our position with the European side. The mandate was informed by policy documents which are agreed at the international level. We have the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, Addis Ababa Action Agenda. At continental level, we had the Africa Union's Agenda 2063. We had the agreed development frameworks of the Caribbean and Pacific. And internally within the OECPS, we had the revised Georgetown Agreement, as well as the outcome documents of the various summits of the heads of states and government of the OECPS, and particularly the Nairobi Nguvu Yapamoja Declaration from the Ninth Summit, which was held in Nairobi, Kenya. It gave the direction on which the group was moving, and also the direction on which to negotiate with our partner. And the outcome, in my estimation, is commendable. I would say that uh, the agreement has ended up with uh, the foundation, with the three regional frameworks, the protocols, and the regional institutions. Framework for implementations have also been defined, although this needs to be further refined through the development of rules or procedures for the operation. We have agreed on the six strategic priorities, which we may all know now that the agreement is uh, publicly available, touching on areas of interest for the OECPS as a region, as a group, but also the separate regional organizations. And we believe this has delivered for us. And issues have been raised on the question of uh, the role of the Secretariat. 
the agreement has identified the institutional framework that will serve to implement the agreement. And we have a three tier structure of OECPS EU level that is at the Council of Ministers, at the Joint Committee of Ambassadors, Senior Officials, and also at the Parliamentary Assembly level. At this stage, we have frameworks at the OECPS level and also within the regions. The OECPS Secretariat has a mandate from its members to be responsible for implementing agreements which have been concluded with third countries. Article 2323. Article 23.3b of the revised Georgetown Agreement provides that the Secretariat of the CPS shall implement as appropriate agreements concluded with third parties. It further provides that the Secretariat shall provide services to the organs of the CPS and as appropriate, the joint institutions established with all external partners, which means on the front and as a responsibility, the Secretariat will coordinate or will have a role to ensure that the agreement is implemented as per mandate, of course, collaborating with any regional institutions which will have a role to play in the implementation. I find it is important to bring out that part because questions have been raised on what the role of the Secretariat will be in the future. But I hasten to add that uh, the consultations are taking place or are due to take place uh, with regard to how the institutional responsibilities will be shared out with the various stakeholders and various organs that are or might be involved in the implementation of the new agreement. So in all, I can say that uh, we have, the ambassadors have delivered on an agreement as provided. It has been noted that yes, there were some challenges and I can say some of the novelties uh, that have come about in the new agreement need to be taken note of. Here, I think the issue of sovereign equality of countries has been brought to the fore. And I think the report has brought out that, which is something positive in ensuring that we are talking about reciprocal commitments on both parties. There is also the issue of the new financing mechanism for the implementation of the agreement. We have uh, the shift from the European Development Fund to the instru new instrument, which was really not part of the negotiations because a decision had already been made in this regard. But it was also not new in the sense that it's an issue which had been floated for a while by the EU side and Although the ACPS had not uh, spoken positively or negatively about it, have embraced it and are ready to implement the agreement in the new structure in terms of uh, support for the implementation of the agreement. So we can say that uh, the regional focus is an improvement. We have proposed policy coherence to ensure that any policy position taken at any level is coherent with national positions and regional positions, and also coherent with uh, the aspects of agreed areas of cooperation. There is also acceptance of the principle of uh, subsidiarity, complementarity, and proportionality. In other words, decisions and actions being taken at the appropriate level, so that if you have a political issue at a regional level, it's most likely that the regional secretariat that has been dealing with that issue at that particular level will address it, after which it may be brought up, up the hierarchy for consideration by the other bodies. There is also the issue of uh, the perception that regional protocols would fragment the OECPS. This, of course, was a major issue at the beginning, but I can say that uh, towards the end, uh, there were necessary confidence building measures efforts to ensure that uh, the new agreement did not achieve that. And I've indicated that uh, we remain with one agreement with regional protocols as part of one whole entire agreement. Some of the other issues that came about, and it has been mentioned in the report, was uh, a perception that we had on the OECPS that 
not in all cases did the EU have a common position. I think migration is one of them, and it's common knowledge that uh, you have always even seen press reports where uh, there are no common positions on migration. That, in a way, filtered down into the negotiations, but did not stop uh, the two parties coming up with a, an agreement that was acceptable on both sides. There was a question of uh, a few sensitive areas. Uh, sexual orientation was one of them. There were others like a death penalty. And in some cases, we found ourselves negotiating amongst our sides before we could reach a consensus, particularly on an issue like death penalty, which was not uh, originally on the table uh, in the negotiations with the EU from the OECD side. So broadly, we believe that we have managed to uh, come up with an agreement that is satisfactory. There was a mention of uh, the EU ACP relations versus EU AU relations. And here I would say that uh, fortunately, we find that uh, the membership in both agreements or arrangements are more or less the same, only that with Africa, you have the Northern African countries, and there is uh, an effort to ensure that there is coherence in what the two levels of arrangements uh, speak to. The agreement under the OECPS EU partnership agreement is legally binding, while the EU AU political arrangements do not have the same level of legal certainty. But being members in the, both, I think there will be possibility to ensure that uh, there is a common approach in ensuring that uh, what has been agreed at the OECPSU level will be used to implement what has been agreed at political level under the AUEU. And this was properly captured in the agreement that has been concluded under the Africa Regional Protocol. I think I want to stop there. And again, I think uh, we could have a, a bigger debate when it comes to the questions and answers that uh, may come from the floor. But I would like to thank Dr. Ishmael for a very comprehensive report, which is a good reference for the work of the group going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Morgan. Uh, you had quite a positive uh, picture on how the OACPS uh, delivered in these negotiations. And you pointed to a number of uh, achievements, including the regional uh, dimension that has been integrated, uh, the, the way uh, a number of sensitive areas have been tackled. I would uh, like to continue with a number of uh, questions to the three participants in this panel. And maybe we should uh, divide our discussion in two parts. The first part on the substantive issues and a second part more on the process and the way this agreement should work in practice. Uh, on the substance, uh, Morgan and, and also uh, Domenico and, and Lane pointed to a number of uh, divergences of views on sexual and reprodu reproductive health rights, uh, the death penalty that was added to the negotiations. We of course know also the migration uh, return and readmission issue that has been there for quite some time on the agenda, gender identity, sexual uh, orientation. Maybe a question for Domenico. We know that there are a number of European member states who are not necessarily happy with some of the uh, uh, deals uh, that have been made on uh, migration and on SRHR. How will this be resolved in the next uh, weeks? Because this is still an issue that apparently seems to bother the smooth implementation of this agreement once it will be signed. Domenico. Okay, no, thank you very much, Gert, for the, the question. It's true that uh, uh, the 27 member state positions are not always fully aligned, specifically on, on, the two, on the two or three issues that you mentioned, uh, the question of migration, uh, uh, return and readmission, essentially, or even for some cases, the, the, the how to harness the positive effect of, uh, uh, of the regular migration, SRHR, and uh, uh, the question of sexual orientation and, and, and gender identity. Um, I would say that uh, the, 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 the idea that we, we tried to 
for these three different elements is to be compliant uh, with, uh, with our mandate that was uh, rather specific and that was mentioning these, uh, uh, for instance, the three, three specific issues. On the SRHR, I think that uh, uh, the result is, uh, is clear. We have the, the, the text that is uh, the text of the council conclusion on the, the recognition of uh, the, 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 the promotion of the SRHR within the, the, the framework of the two um, overarching conferences, Cairo and Beijing and the, the, the follow-up uh, uh, regional conferences. So I think that this is a big achievement compared to the to, to post to, to Cotonou where this, uh, this issue was not even mentioned. Uh, I think that uh, there was a consensus uh, uh, on the ACP side to, to have this, uh, this reference and this reference is in the foundation. Then of course, uh, I think that, and this is, was useful in having these three different, three protocol that each region moved uh, in a different way. You have the Montevideo consensus that is mentioning SOGI, that is mentioning uh, sexual rights and so on. You have the, 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 the Asia and the Pacific declaration, or we have the Addis Abeba uh, declaration. And the, the, the three regional follow-up uh, um, conferences of the uh, um, Cairo conference, I think that they, they, they managed to, to move uh, Till where the, the region could move, and I think that is important that we manage to capture this differentiation in the in the three regional protocol because it's a, it's a clear progress compared to to to, to Cotonou. It's clear that sometimes we have the, the the same problem internally because we we, we have to to keep the, the our constituency uh, aligned between behind what. Uh, what we can negotiate externally. And I must say that on SRHR, there, there is a specific language that is in the negotiating directive. We stick to the negotiating directive. I think that we didn't go below the ambition of the negotiating directive, even if the, at, some, at some point also our member states that they will have to, to, to abide to the rules. Otherwise, uh, why to be part of the club if the rules can be uh, put into question each time that is convenient for one of the members. So I think that, that this is the, the most important. On uh, migration, I think that, uh, and this is my, I would say I'm speaking on a personal basis. I think that uh, we put too much emphasis on the uh, migration side, in particular when we are, we are talking with the, uh, with the ACP. Uh, migration is a limited problem, is a big problem for Europe, but, but is a limited problem for the ACP. And is a problem that is only concerned a limited number of African countries in, in a way. So even if we wanted to, I would say, uh, multilateralize uh, the problem. So I think that, and uh, the, 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 the big uh, issue that we had under Cotonou is that Article 13 didn't produce any, any effect in terms of, uh, I would say, um, return and readmission in particular. And this is why I think that we managed to have this protocol on return and readmission where we, we managed to have, uh, I would say, the two position uh, Together, on one side, the request for uh, an unconditional return and readmission of uh, uh, illegal migrants, and on the other side, the, the request coming from the ACP for having uh, proper identification uh, processes. So I think that, uh, I don't know if I answered your, your question, but I think that this is the, the, the best uh, uh, we, could, we could achieve. Yeah. yeah, okay, but I, I stop here for the, for the time. Yes, I, I, I just interrupt you, Domenico. Thank you very much for your uh, answer, because I see in the chat that there's more questions addressed to you, so have a look at these. But before I give you the floor again, I would like to ask Morgan and then also Lane what they see as the biggest uh, substantial issues, issues on content that could still play a, a role in uh, the next uh, stages of this uh, agreement, because we need to move towards uh, uh, signing this agreement towards the end of the year. And then at a certain moment, it also needs to be working. And some say that the text is relatively vague, uh, that it is not always very explicit, just to avoid that there would now already be disagreement on some of the 
content related issues. What are your views on this, uh, Morgan? And then Lane, very short because we don't have much time. Thank you. Uh, my view is that uh, these issues are now settled. It took a long time to come up with a delicately negotiated language uh, on the four issues that you have raised. And I think uh, neither side would want any reopening, either through interpretation or through changing of the text as it is. For the OECPS, perhaps what may need to be given further in-depth uh, consideration is the finances that will support implementation. Because in the negotiations, as you may know, the multi-annual financial framework had not been finalized and we couldn't get into details on an agreement that had not been concluded on the EU side. The issue on DICI, how it will be implemented, is still an outstanding issue that requires further uh, study. And in particular, the points related to multi-country programs, programs that will cut across the three regions, uh, is an issue that perhaps would be uh, one of greater attention going forward. Of course, on the OECPS side, we are thinking of the issue of implementation, the role of the various entities that will be involved in this. It is foreseen that a number of uh, seminars will be held to clarify how this will be done so that uh, we ensure that the agreement achieves its set objective of uh, supporting the uh, intended constituency, which is the citizens of our countries. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Um, Lane, uh, you've heard the two institutional parties who were sitting at the negotiating table for such a long time. Uh, I would like to invite you to give a reaction on the way both parties uh, perceive uh, the outcome of this negotiation. And then there is also a question uh, by uh, Isolina Botto, uh, who is uh, uh, asking uh, how this new agreement will offer an opportunity to the OACPS to strengthen the links with the regions and countries across the ACP. Uh, is this agreement going to help uh, it more intense South-South uh, cooperation? Over to you, Lane. Thank you very much, Geert. Um, I'm not going to go back over any of the, the points raised by Morgan and uh, uh, Dominicho, which I thought were, you know, straight to the point with respect of an institutional view. And I want to thank Morgan very much for uh, reading the report and uh, thinking that it, 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 it bore resemblance uh, to the manner in which the negotiations actually played out. Um, but very quickly to say that um, I want to speak to the matter raised by Esolina. Uh, it's something which I, I, I mentioned in the report, it's something which I mentioned in the presentation. I don't necessarily see the new agreement as given an impetus to deepen the relationship between the various constituent parts of the ACP. That impetus is going to have to come from the ACP itself, from its membership. We can never forget that the relationship between Africa and the Caribbean has been a, historically a very, very tight and a very, very strong one. But this was in the past, during the time of Pan-Africanism, uh, working towards uh, dealing with apartheid and uh, colonialism and racism. But over time, that relationship has not continued in a structurally or systemically productive way. It has been rather ad hoc. Um, and I believe that if we are to have an important future for the organization of the ACP, which I continue to think of the ACP as opposed to the OACP, requires very much the refocusing within the capitals and within the various regions which are part of the ACP to look to each other as a group, if 79 countries working in tandem on the world stage stand for something. Uh, very important work had been done in the past with respect to a repositioning of the organization as an actor on the world stage. Uh, that work is still very much there. 
What it takes is political will and resources and intention to actually make this relationship happen. And I think if the ACP, in fact, is strengthened with that type of resolve, uh, all of the parts of the ACP um, in terms of their own relationship and moving and advocating for their own, their own future will actually bear fruit, especially now, Geert, where we see geopolitically so many changes on the world stage. Um, we see developing countries assuming positions of real global power. Uh, we see India emerging as well as China as gateways for the global south. Uh, these are opportunities to be exploited by the ACP. And I think it's within their mandate and their future to be able to pursue those. Thank you, Lane. Uh, maybe a number of questions related to the equal partnership and uh, this, uh, this desire to build a partnership amongst equals. And uh, my question is, and it's also linked to the question that Niklas Meyer has put, um, are we uh, really moving away from a kind of donor recipient relationship with less conditionalities? Uh, is this possible uh, if uh, 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 we see that uh, a number of articles like Article 96 and 97 uh, will be abolished? Uh, will this lead to less aid conditionalities? Or are we still in a donor recipient uh, dynamic where one party is still funding the institutions of the other party? Um, so the question may be first for uh, Morgan. How much are we moving towards real equal partnership? It is acknowledged that uh, in terms of uh, economic weight, the two parties cannot be equal partners. And that's why we are talking about the principle of equality, of uh, sovereign equality. Increasingly, you get messages even from OECPS leaders who have sent out the message that uh, we should not be receiving aid. Rather, we should be talking about increased trade and improving the level playing field for the successful performance of the economies of the OECPS. So the partnership we believe will continue to require financial support to implement. And we have not moved away from the essential and fundamental elements of the partnership. The OECPS did not even question those provisions. However, we improved the way the management of those two, the conditionalities that are the, that the person asking is uh, referring to, that the conditionalities will be brought about only through an exhaustive process which has taken into account the conditions of the country concerned so that the implementation of those aspects of the partnership are not supposed to be punitive, but rather to be corrective. And with that approach, I think we came up with a good text and uh, the relevant article and the final provisions and that will see us at least improve how we managed the implementation of the agreement. That's what I can say with regard to those two points. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Morgan. A question for Domenico. Uh, we always have had within the ACP-EU partnership a dedicated financial envelope, the European Development Fund. This has now disappeared. It's no longer there. Uh, we will move into uh, an, an DICI instrument or a global Europe instrument, uh, a neighborhood development and international cooperation instrument. What are the implications for the regions, for the regional indicative programs, and also for the African Union, Africa protocol of the agreement? Uh, how will they be involved in the next uh, programming cycle, 2021-2027? That's a question by Gauthier Schaefer of the uh, Institute for European Environmental Policy. Domenico, please. Thank you very much. Uh, um, so on this question, I think that uh, uh, is also related to, to, to other part of, of, the, of the question, that on the fact that uh, 
we managed finally to move away from this uh, uh, donor or recipient uh, relationship because the, in a way in the external relation of the Afri or the European Union the EDF uh, uh, represented the kind of anomaly because uh, the Cotonou was the only agreement where there was uh, a specific and dedicated instrument that was outside the budget we have no other the association agreement between the EU and the other country, you can take all the Northern African countries and they, they have no specific uh, instrument attached to, the, to their agreement. So I think this is a, a clearly a, a modernization of the relation. Second, the, the, the two things are in a way the, the two aspects. On one side, you have the agreement that it represents the political uh, uh, relation and the, the, the framework in which our relation should be uh, built. And on the other side, we have the implementation of the financial instrument that will serve to deliver on the priority of the, uh, of the agreement. And on the agreement, of course, we have, I would say, a, a mutual responsibility in delivering in a way. And I think this is the, the, the most important stuff in terms of, I would say, moving away from the, the donor uh, beneficiary uh, relationship. I would say the modality are the ones that are explained in the in the in Diki that uh, were mutualized a little bit from the EDF and sometime from the DCI, the former DCI. In a way, the, the what is disappearing from the, the, the future is this, uh, I would say, this kind of co-management that was uh, in itself a little bit a, a, a kind of a, a hypocrisy, I would say, in terms of uh, management of the, uh, of the aid, because it was creating an unnecessary burden on the, the administration of the beneficiary country in terms of managing the, the aid according to the rules of the, of the EDF. Now we are in, in, a, in a much clearer uh, framework uh, where this burden is not existing anymore, but where, of course, there is this dialogue about the, the choice uh, of the priority, the choice of the, the objectives, the, the choice of the instruments that we would like to put in place in order to achieve what are the, the national or the regional, the regional priorities. And therefore, I think that the, the, also the, the, the role of the national authorities, of the regional authority is, uh, is in a way different. Thank you, Domenico. I take a few uh, more questions, maybe a question in relation to the actors in this partnership, eh? civil society, private sector, also parliamentary actors. There's a few questions related to that. Um, we all know that Cotonou was quite uh, uh, revolutionary in terms of uh, the articles relating to participation of uh, non-state actors, uh, participation also of parliaments, uh, private sector, civil society, to what extent will this agreement uh, be able to avoid maybe the pitfalls that we have seen with Cotonou? Because Cotonou had text, had a lot of good text, but in practice, if you talk to civil society, uh, if you talk to private sector, they were not necessarily uh, convinced that this agreement was really reaching out to them. Is this going to be different now? And then in relation to the parliaments and the parliamentary scrutiny, we had a joint parliamentary assembly uh, always, and now we will have, in addition to the JPA, also parliamentary uh, instruments uh, at the level of the different regions. Uh, it all looks a bit complex in terms of role division, but the question that was put by Chris Pellegrims, who has been very active himself in the past in the European Parliament, who is now working with Egmont, uh, is whether uh, the parliamentary scrutiny in this new agreement will be increased or weakened. I would like to ask maybe first uh, Lane to come in on this and our two institutional actors can still reflect on that question. Please Lane, do you think that this agreement is really an agreement that will move beyond the uh, governmental actors and also excite and involve a whole range of other players, including parliaments and non-state actors, private sector, civil society. We'll have to see, Geert. Um, the truth is I have not myself studied in detail uh, the new agreement, 
uh, which was initial just a couple of days ago. Uh, but my own experience, for example, if I just speak uh, to two issues, uh, one with the joint parliament, the JPA, even without any other layers, constitutionally now in a new agreement, my own participation in them always always um, uh, found that uh, they were quite lacking in, in, in two areas. One, um, when I participated here in Brussels and even more recently uh, as a result of having been invited, I found that the participation on the OACP side was rather fulsome, but the seats on the other side were mainly empty. So there didn't seem to be huge amount of institutional interest here uh, with respect of the m mechanism and the, the reason for the JPA. Uh, secondly, even within uh, the OACP, and I'll just speak for my own region, there was never a, a real sense that discussions at this level as part of Cotonou ever found them their way into very robust discussions when parliamentarians returned home to capitals to their own parliament. So there seemed to have been a number of opportunities lost. How the different parliaments will in fact relate one to another is left to be seen. And I'm sure Morgan can tell us a little bit more about this. Um, with respect to civil society, up to the time that I was party to the ACP and part of the Committee of Ambassadors, we tried very hard to include actors from civil society, NGOs and various groups in various events. They never went very far and probably never went far enough. There always seemed to have been uh, the need for closer synergies between capitals in the actual choice of the actors who were invited to those events. And I'm not quite sure how the new agreement actually uh, safeguards uh, a more open invitation for various actors to come in. The third quick thing that I will say, however, is one that I've experienced on the ground in that there are civil society actors on the ground in many of our capitals, many of our regions, who in fact have much more of a direct relationship with the partner overseas who actually provides funds than a good set of relations and rapport within the country in which they are based. This creates all sorts of tensions. It creates tensions at the domestic level with the government of the day. It creates tensions as well for the ACP Secretariat with respect of putting together a list of representative actors to actually visit. And it creates tensions as well with uh, the EU as a partner who in fact felt that there should be much more by way of invitations to civil society groups to attend various events. How it will play out in the future, I, I rather suspect that Morgan would be more equipped than I would be to speak to that. Thank you, Lane. I see that we still have five minutes and I will uh, give each of you uh, the floor. Uh, on this particular question of uh, parliaments and the institutional frameworks and also the participation of non-state actors, uh, that's definitely a question on which I would like to have an answer from uh, both uh, Morgan and Domenico. Uh, but I would like to add one final question. It's a question re that relates uh, to the role of the OACPS in the multilateral system. There is a big and a strong belief that the OACPS will be a major uh, player will be a group that can support also Europeans uh, or Europe's agendas in the multilateral system. So to what extent uh, will OACPS be able to play its role and prove its value added uh, also at the level of New York beyond the Brussels scene at the level of the UN agencies? Uh, maybe Morgan could start with this uh, question, but also try to take that first question that I had on the parliaments and the civil society actors. You all have uh, one and a half minutes left before I hand over to uh, Gunther for the closing remarks. On the role of ACPS in the multilateral system, uh, this has been recognized as uh, one of the key areas in which the partnership will uh, be fairly active. There are talks on how the modalities for cooperation will be implemented. You may be aware that uh, the ACPS presence in Geneva has been quite uh, instrumental in uh, 
the members' interest being taken care of at uh, the WTO in the negotiations and uh, the outcomes. With the numbers that we have, we believe that uh, we could contribute a major role in the outcome of uh, international discourse on various subjects in New York and elsewhere. So the modalities will be established, it's work in progress. On parliamentary scrutiny, I think we have delivered on what the members of parliament had requested. You may be aware that uh, the EU did not have a mandate to have uh, JPA at OECPSEU level, but in the course of the negotiations, this demand was put forward and discussions with them was that uh, they were satisfied with the final text that has been agreed. With regard to stakeholders, that is the civil society, other stakeholders, we will look at how we establish platforms for networking. When it comes to uh, stakeholders like the economic operators or the part of the OECPS, there is a mandate to institutionalize a business forum, and this could be a good avenue for OECPS stakeholders in that front to uh, come forward and engage, not only amongst themselves within the OECPS, but also with the EU, once we have established the modalities for how these stakeholders were not direct actors in the agreement to play a role. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Domenico, your final uh, reactions? I think that uh, a multilateral uh, uh, function of the OECPS, I think that they, they could do uh, a, a real good job in connecting the, the dots between Brussels capitals and New York. I think that is the, they could be really instrumental. We did a, a small exercise very recently in order uh, to support the election of the co-chair of the COVAX shareholders council and uh, we were successful, by, by the way. So uh, the, I would say that the first attempt that we put in place uh, resulted in, in a success is a small one, but I think that we can build, uh, build on it. And the, the other uh, point on the parliamentary scrutiny, we considered because the, 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 the center of gravity moved to the, to the region and in order to, to also to, to, to respond what, uh, to, to some criticism that at some point there were these big gathering, but nothing was brought back to, uh, to, the, to the countries, that the, the, the most appropriate level was the, the regional level, in particular of parliamentary assembly in connection with the Council of the Minister in order to discuss the agenda, to discuss the results and so on. So I think that uh, in a way we increased the, the, the parliamentary scrutiny in the implementation of the agreement without, I would say, having this big uh, gathering that of course remained because the, the, the European Parliament was very much in favor of keeping the JPA at the ACPU level, where at the end we can, I would say, uh, add doubt about the, 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 the result, the efficiency and the, 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 the real uh, uh, use of this, uh, this uh, JPA at the ACPU level. Over to you, Gerd. Thank you, Domenico. So, Lane, you started with a, a very interesting, exciting presentation. Uh, so you have the last uh, word uh, in this debate, not the last word before the closing, uh, but uh, in any case, your final observations, final reactions. Are there any issues that you have uh, learned also from this debate that you would take with you, uh, maybe also in the next stages, uh, of, of this uh, OACPS uh, EU uh, agreement and probably implementation uh, related. Please, over to you. I'd like to, to, to stare my comments a little bit outside of the frame that you've just uh, described, if you don't mind. Uh, really just to focus my one minute and a half on, on something a little bit more specific, which is simply to say that the ACP and I, don't apologize for calling it the ACP. I know it's the OACP, but I think of the ACP is a creature of two personalities, two characters. Uh, one central purpose has always been the relationship with Europe and to provide that coordinated and very important function. And Morgan has spoken to that. But there is another opportunity as well, which has always been there, which is for the OACP to be also that fulcrum to, to inspire a deepening of the re relations between the various constituent parts. That has been underinvested over time, and there's an opportunity to do that in a more fulsome way. But the third 
unexplored aspect of the character of the OACP is as a global actor on the world stage on its own merit, where it will look at issues of development for finance, it will look at climate change, it will look at trade agreements, it will look at all of those sort of issues which materially affect the future of the countries that it represents and make pronouncements, do the intellectual work that is required to have a position as a body on the world stage. Uh, whilst we say, of course, be on the world stage and do things at the UN, we can't lose sight of the fact that the member states of the UN are also equally the member states that sit around the table as the ACP. And ambassadors on both sides have different mandates. But what is required is for the ACP to coordinate its work and its actions and its lobbying, especially now, uh, much more actively with the, the G77 and China, with other groups like that, and to also seek third party arrangements with countries like uh, China, with India, with Brazil, and all of these are discussions which have been had in the body corporate of the uh, OACP over time. And my own sensibility, my own wish in all of this is that the focus on what can be done within the group for the benefit of the group, whilst taking care of all of the rest, uh, would be given additional focus over the next 20 years. Thank you very much, Lane. I think we had uh, an interesting uh, debate. Uh, uh, it's very clear that this agreement uh, has been uh, quite a complex uh, uh, agreement uh, with lots of challenges. Uh, so how to make it work will, will be the biggest challenge. So I invite everyone to be uh, uh, present uh, maybe in uh, uh, a number of uh, months or years from here, from now to see uh, to what extent the high ambitions have been realized. With this, I would like to hand over to uh, Gunther. I think Gunther will make the, the final remarks, please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Gert. Thank you very much, Len, Domenico, and Morgan for the presentation, for the discussion. Len, you had a tremendous task. Summarize nearly three years of uh, negotiation within 15 minutes. And I think you did great, you did a great job. And these insights you gave us, um, that you gave um, also, uh, Domenico and Morgan, uh, throughout your comments and the discussion, are very helpful to understand these processes of negotiations. Because for outsiders, especially if you are not in Brussels, as it's the case for me, I'm based at the Konrad Stiftung's headquarters in Berlin, it's all very difficult to get a real insight into these negotiations. And these insights are very helpful to, to, to understand the dynamics and to, to be able to, to understand also the outcome, to understand the text. Yeah, we heard that it's a very complex matter. The, the scope of the, the treaty was very ambitious. Uh, that's why some criticized that the text may be too vague at some places, but I, I really much like the, uh, the wording uh, that Morgan used. Uh, Morgan, you said it's a delicately negotiated language, puts a very, very nice words, uh, the, the, what is the challenge of such a complex and ambitious uh, treaty as it is the case um, if you bind together four regions with very different um, mindsets, um, um, challenges, um, um, frameworks, uh, political uh, culture, and yeah, that is the result. And of course, Phil, you're also correct if you say how to make it work is now the biggest um, the biggest challenge, the biggest task that lays uh, ahead of us. And that is one of the reasons why Conrad Arnold Stiftung in general and our, um, our multinational development policy dialogue in, in Brussels will continue to, um, to be part of this process, to, to inform you, to, to get in touch with you, to discuss, to discuss all this that lays ahead of us when we want to make this treaty work. So please stay tuned on the activities of our multinational development policy dialogue in Brussels and maybe also of our other activities, be it um, in the headquarters or in different other countries uh, worldwide, because there's more to come and I, more, I will be more than happy to, to meet you all again in, other, in some other opportunity. Thank you very much again, Len, for the presentation, Domenico, Morgan, for the discussion, Fred, for the excellent moderation and Caroline, of course, Thank you to you and Dennis Shry and your team for organizing this event. 
Um, everybody said, and I want to repeat it, it was very, very timely. It is very relevant, it's very important, and it helps us to understand more what's going on between our regions. And I wish you all a nice week and see you all in another occasion. Thank you.